strengthen its policies and programs. And that was not limited just on government, but across society. If one were to come back to agriculture and the land sector, both in terms of uh, land policy in particular, issues of gender equality have been put on the table. And I would say even in issues of agricultural policy. But for me, I don't think the issue is about the policy framework per se, because sometimes policy tends to be gender neutral. And yet we all know that the starting point in terms of the challenges that you know, patriarchy has posed in our society, women's access to means of production is not always a given. If I were to take one of the constraints and also one of the areas that facilitates women's participation in agriculture, it's access to land. And as we know that in a number of countries, access to land by women is in their proximity to men, other as husbands, uncles, or even fathers. We've had a That's very case um, in South Africa in the past year where one of the women actually challenged through the Constitutional Court a brother because of the way in which the inheritance to land was made by their father and called on the government to actually ensure that the rights of women are actually enshrined even when it comes to the inheritance laws. And I think that was a shift which was very interesting in terms of testing our equality clause in the court of law as it relate to land as, you know, in terms of access. But we've gone further as government to actually ensure that in our land policy legislation and programs, we put it up front to the access for women at 50% of all the assets that government in terms of its land reform program must, you know, put up front. But what has been the successes? Policy has been there, legislative instruments are there, but it hasn't translated to that 50% that we would all like to see. There has been uh, access, yes, but to the level at which we can say we are comfortable as a country in terms of women's ownership to land and women's fuller participation in agriculture and agribusiness generally, its equity is still not there. And these are the issues we've been reflecting on from a government side, but also generally working with the industry. What are the constraints? If you look within government, we don't have an instrument from the public uh, fiscals, for instance, to be able to assess how the budget allocation for women, you know, should ensure that it's in tandem with what we perceive as policy. So that has not been realized. And it's something that we're currently working on with the UN women to look at how we actually deal with our procurement spent as women, both in terms of land acquisition and also other programmatic intervention to make sure that we actually satisfy that objective in terms of supporting women. Issues of market access, again, another challenge where women's access to market is still an impediment, not because policy is not there, but I think it's in the programmatic intervention where we are found actually wanting, as well as on monitoring and um, evaluation. So we do need to put tools in place, particularly when it comes to monitor and evaluating our policies and programs, as well as our laws, to what extent in their application are able to make sure that we can find possibilities where women can participate effectively in our agricultural economy as a country. And I just want to make an example, Meredith and Wanjeru and my fellow panelists. If one were to look at what has happened with the uh, challenges of COVID-19 and how countries responded, while one appreciated that um, COVID-19 was in large measure a health pandemic, but its disruptions on the economy and social livelihood was actually felt by all of us. In the agricultural, for instance, one thing that we found was that countries who depend on food imports, as well as the importation of inputs, 
were severely affected in terms of them being able to attain their food security uh, levels. Internal movement in countries, even ourselves, to the fields was also constrained because either people needed, you know, the permits to indicate that, yes, there are farmers and they are going to the fields as agriculture was allowed, in our case, under alert level five. But still, these were the problems because they had to contend with your security forces who sometimes just did not uh, take those, uh, you know, statements by women as serious. So a majority of women smallholder farmers were actually affected in this regard. Issues of agricultural mm -hmm. markets locally and in the region were also a challenge. If one looks at agricultural okay. trade, it was That's also disrupted. The, if one looks well, at in agricultural sector, we've had a lot of job losses as a result of COVID-19. And if you look again of the profile of who are the ones that are the large workforce, it will be women. If one looks at the crop calendars that were missed in our regions, for instance, because of those disruptions, your smallholder farmers who in large measure are women actually were on the receiving end. The logistics of transporting food within countries was also not as efficient as one would love. I would recall that in one of the situations under level five, we had said agriculture is an essential service, but nobody actually took into consideration among the whole of government that your marketing agents and market women who actually sell some of this fresh produce to ordinary citizens are an important part of the value chain. So it took about a week or so to actually knock to our command council structure to say, this is an important element that will facilitate the movement of goods so that it can reach the desired um, you know, beneficiaries. I'm just highlighting these as one of those issues when it comes to implementation, where we find ourselves you know, frustrated as to how do we make sure that women as players in the agricultural sector beyond policy are actually enabled to be able to participate in the agricultural economy as a whole. So the current challenges of COVID have therefore brought into sharp focus our policies as government, our legislation and programs on whether or not are they effective in ensuring that women as the important participants in this industry have an equal share. It has also called into question the extent to which our policy are actually gender responsive even in matters of crisis. As we know that a number of our countries, smallholder farmers are women and they are the ones who tend to be severely affected when there are challenges. So I could actually say that's the brief I would want to put to you, you know, and then I will take questions as we go on and as moderated by Meredith. Thank you so much. Um, really a lot of riches there for us to consider and unpack. I would like to now um, turn over that set, same set of questions to the Honorable Kilimo. Could you please um, join us with your comments? Oh, he hello, you can see me? Yes. Am I audible? I'm audible? Yes, yes, we can see you and hear you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. I think I'm answering to what has my government done, yes? Yes. Yeah, or what has it been doing towards more gender responsive agricultural policies? First of all, I take this opportunity to thank uh, Wanjiro and, uh, and all at award for inviting me. I must say that uh, I am a new person in issues of agriculture, although I've been farming, my name, my name itself means agriculture. I have been so much on uh, gender issues, FGM, human rights and all that. 
And now I am on animal welfare and also the fish and even farming. Now, uh, the government of Kenya has a program under the Ministry of Agriculture called NALEP. NALEP means National Agriculture and Livestock Extension Program. And the mandate is to mainstream or to guide uh, the rest of Kenyans to mainstream gender issues in the agricultural sector with an overall goal of contributing to the social economic uh, development for poverty alleviation and uptake of technologies to which one zero is heading uh, part of those technologies, you know, women research and development, and we are grateful that there is such a thing. So this is what NALEP aims uh, to do. Our country also is a signatory to CEDAW, where there's nothing about discrimination, the Beijing Platform of Action, the MDGs, and we have a body called National Gender and Equality Commission. So in Kenya, we have enough policy framework and laws. However, when it comes to practicality or uptake of these uh, agricultural policies, we are not doing well in that aspect. First of all, agriculture has been devolved, meaning it is in the counties that most of these policies are implemented. The people to oversight whether these policies are implemented are people who are nominated either by the governor of the county, of the state county, and at times we have the member of the county assemblies. So there is a lot of uh, push and pull as to whether the agricultural officers in the counties are actually implementing these very good policies that have been made at the national government. Because where I sit from, we, we make policies, but the implementation is done uh, at the counties. I feel that a lot has been done to ensure that women play a pivotal role in agriculture. Now, the challenges faced by women. Our constitution has allowed us to get land but the social uh, convention is at war with the written law, for example, or even people themselves to just accept that this is my space I have been given by the constitution so that they can say, I want to utilize the land properly. Women still feel like they're outsiders when it comes to ownership of land, especially where you want to get something from your brother, you want to share land with your brothers, or even where you're married and say this is land, mostly in the social thinking, land still belongs to men. We have laws, we have something, uh, uh, we have uh, something called Women Enterprise Fund. This Women Enterprise Fund is a, supposed to support women with finances because initially we identified that women have no access to funding. Now, the Women Enterprise Fund, however, gives money to groups. And women, because of the concerns of each individual woman, they would try, uh, because of the concerns of each individual woman, sometimes operating in a group to realize the economics of uh, you want to, as an individual, can be a challenge. Very well thought out to address the issue of access to funds, resources, but the individual benefit is not there. So you will find then, women will abandon and just work at the basic needs. You know, every, women have their, their, their reason, uh, I mean, they wake up every day to address the basic needs of the family. So challenges for us, uh, I feel, is that there is goodwill and there is political goodwill, 
most of the time it is more spoken, but implementation is still a, a challenge. Uh, we also have kitchen garden, promotion of kitchen garden for the smallholder farmers. So many programs with development partners, but they're so minute just to meet the basic needs that now this, my question would be that, how do we make governments accountable for these policies to remove women from just being smallholder farmers to become macro? In most cases, it is the men who are doing the macro. To address some of the challenges right now uh, for farm inputs, you will find that men, because of the meetings that they normally meet after work, they get more informed as they share information. Women hardly get that time to share information. Our country has come up with something called e voucher to address farm inputs. Now, as to how many women listen to the information that you can now venture into farming that uh, will generate income because their country will give you 70%, the government, national government will give you 70% of the farm input and you raise the 30, is still another story because you're still depending on the county governments to facilitate or to pass on that information because women are not able to get. I'm bringing this because the way of communication is still a challenge for women to understand what is there for them. It is like, you know you have been given, but you don't know that you have been given. You know you are right. I mean, you've been given an avenue to claim your right, but you are not aware. There is need to look at the way we communicate policies so that women can take up these policies and implement because they will go for it. At the end of the day, if they see that it adds value to their family, it will move them from one point to another, they will take the risk. After all, women are such risk takers. But the mode of communicating this, this is what I am discovering as I come to the Ministry of Agriculture and I find there are so many programs that need to be, to be implemented, but lack of knowledge, lack of information. I feel one of the other issues that uh, women lack is the fact that they live, most majority women live in far flanked uh, parts of the country, they are not, most of them are not in the cities. And so the geographical uh, habitation of these women, sometimes they'll have to think twice, do I go or I don't go? And if I go, what happens to everything that you are managing in, in the homestead? So there is something that I feel that uh, should be done is how we communicate these policies to the African woman. And once we internalize these policies and domesticate, we will be able to move. Uh, we, can, we can actually say we have mainstreamed gender. We have an organization I had said earlier, National Gender and Equality Commission. This in the National Gender and Equality Commission is supposed to ensure that government institutions have what our government pronounced that there must be at least minimum 30% representation of women in an organization, especially in their leadership. So that looks at those in leadership. But what about those in farming? I feel they still uh, a gap there, which I feel that if it can be driven by there are women in agriculture now that we are in agriculture that don't just look at those who are working or in offices. Let us look at also 
the benefits, can we say 30% of the benefits from the farm goes to the women. Otherwise, at the end of the day, the women do all the toiling, especially in the rural areas. When it comes to the payment, the banks could be very far. This woman will have to think, do I leave the chickens and everything to go to a bank? The most versatile person to go is the man. Mm -hmm. And that will be the end of um, controlling those finances by Thank the women. You, Honorable Kalima. Thank you. Yes. Uh, that, those were Over. very insightful comments and I think very um, complimentary um, to the um, earlier comments regarding we're starting to see policies that are gender responsive, but we're not seeing the implementation and that there is great opportunity for more measurement. So let's move on to um, Dr. Karia and, and see what she has to say. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, uh, Wanjiru and Meredith for inviting me for this uh, pre-session. And also thank you very much to Honorable Kilimo and uh, Honorable Didiza for very, very insightful comments. What I'm going to talk to you about is uh, my organization. I work for the Food and Agriculture Organization. And also how, how do we support governments to, to have gender responsive agriculture policies? Um, I, FAO is a specialized agency of the UN and actually leads the international efforts to defeat hunger all our evidence right now is telling us that uh, hung, the number of hungry people in the world is not decreasing and actually it's really high. And in the coming years, the world will need to step up our efforts in this area. To do this, rural women are key. I think Honorable uh, Kilimo and Didza have highlighted this, so I don't need to say any more. What I'd like you to know is that even within FAO, we know that uh, if we're going to address uh, hunger, rural women have an important role to play. And for this reason, gender is treated as a cross-cutting theme and is mainstreamed throughout our strategic framework. It is also, uh, we also have a gender equality policy that uh, guides our work. <clears throat> so I'll give you just uh, three examples of how we are working to support our member states uh, to have more gender responsive policies. I'll talk a little bit about how we engage at the regional and global fora. I'll talk about uh, how providing evidence and finally the tools and methods that uh, we have been developing to support member states. So at, uh, one of the things that we know is really important is to make sure that international debates, global debates, global policy debates on food security and nutrition adequately pay attention to gender. And one of the forum that we've been engaging with in this context um, is the Committee on World Food Security, which has been an incredible fo uh, forum for us to engage with. It's a multi-stakeholder group of everybody who works in agriculture, governments, development agencies, academia, civil society, private sector, and uh, CFS is, uh, as it's called, is also the only body within the UN-wide system that is tasked with dealing with food security and nutrition issues. What we've done is, uh, as, as uh, the CFS develops these voluntary guidelines that countries endorse, uh, and the, the, the guidelines are really important because they, they provide uh, governments with policy recommendations and guidance on how to develop uh, policies, laws, programs on a wide range of food security issues. What we've done is to make sure each of those guidance have a gender equality principle. And it's been a negotiation process, but really important to push the agenda forward. Uh, another, area, another way we've engaged with CFS since 2019 is uh, with lots of negotiations, discussions, we are now, uh, CFS in 2019 has actually included a standalone work stream on gender equality and women's empowerment in the context of food security in its upcoming multi-year program of work. It's really important that the ministers of agriculture are engaging around gender equality issues. This is why we've, uh, we've really advanced this. And then I was really happy to hear uh, Honorable Didisa talk about COVID. 
how else have we been engaging? What we have found, and this has come out everywhere, is that a lot of the uh, national policy response plans that have come out as a result of COVID have consistently not applied the genderless. Women have been, women's leadership has been absent. And many of them have not even looked at women as economic uh, actors. So the, the policies do not really address their concerns and their issues. So what have we done? We've established, um, uh, uh, FAO has established together with um, the International Institute for Sustainable Development and Oxfam parliamentary dialogues where members of parliament from Africa, Europe, Latin America, and Caribbean have been able to share lessons learned and good practices on how gender responsive approaches to food security and nutrition can be during the times of COVID. Um, let me go to uh, the second area of work where we've uh, engaged has been, and it's really important, is around providing evidence for informed policy making. So how do we support a national government so that the policies are based on evidence? And we say this because when we look at national, global, and sectorial policies and programs for food security and nutrition, they do not always capture women's roles and women's contribution, and therefore fail to respond to their specific needs and challenges. So in this regard, FAO has been developing what we call country gender assessments that provide evidence on the rural gender inequalities in the country, it provides data, it also provides recommendation and guidance on where the key entry points are in terms of addressing um, rural gender inequalities. It's a very powerful document that can inform different organizations as they engage in, this, in, this, uh, in developing policies that are gender responsive. To date, we have probably more than 70 country gender assessments in country. So any country, once they start developing their policies, they have this uh, resource to call upon. Uh, the third area I want to talk to you about is around the tools and methods that we've been developing uh, in terms of strengthening the capacities of countries to design and implement gender responsive policies. So um, what we do know for sure is that well-designed agriculture policies can help close the gender gap in agriculture. But the question is, what does a well-designed policy look like? And we've, we've prepared, we've developed a tool called the Gender in Agriculture Policy Analysis Tool that helps governments to analyze their policy from a gender perspective, find out where the gaps are in the policy, and develop very concrete policy solutions for the next way forward. Uh, the policy areas that we've covered, I think, are the same ones that uh, Honorable Didiza talked about access to land, uh, access to markets, employment, financial services, advisory services, agriculture research, amongst others. And what the, the, the gender in agriculture policy analysis tool does is it analyzes, it does a desk review of policy texts and looks to, and also follows up with uh, interviewing of uh, stakeholders to see uh, where, where did we make a mistake? It, do, the, do the results make sense? And we use what we call standardized scorecards that come from red, which is gender blind or gender discriminatory, all the way to green, which is more sensitive policy provisions. And then the findings of the GAPO, the, it's not just a report. It is there in terms of trying to generate conversation. Generate conversation amongst stakeholders in agriculture, but also identify where are the entry points in terms of making the policies more gender responsive. Um, very quickly, just to say what, what challenges we have, um, and then I'll stop by recognizing the time dimension. The first challenge we have is the lack of reliable national level statistics on the women's role in agriculture. And this, if we don't have this, then we are not able to actually make the case for investing in agriculture. You know, information on women's land ownership, productivity, asset ownership, all this information is still very much not collected by countries. A, a second challenge we've had is around the turnover of staff. 
the lack of capacities, uh, commitment uh, by the policymakers. This is hugely important. And the turnover means that we have to keep training. We have to keep training uh, new people as they come. Um, I, I think I'll stop there for the moment and I'll answer other parts if I'm asked questions. Thank you, over yeah. to you. Thank you so much, Susan. Um, very well um, accepted remarks um, and very in line with the others. I think I, I wanted to turn it over to Wanjiru for a moment. Thank you so much, Meredith. I am, um, with your permission and everyone's permission, I would like to do a little bit of a change to the program. We know that Honorable Didisa is, um, needs to hop off and, and join a, a really important government meeting at this moment. And so I want, but I still would love to get her insights from her on some of the other questions that we have coming up in the, in the second question, second session. And the second session of this is the kind of second half of, of our, our meeting today is really a conversation about how do we increase the number of women who are at the state table helping set and leading the Afri African agricultural policy agenda. And so um, I have three questions and, and this also gives a heads up to the, uh, the rest of the panel. Um, Honorable Didiza, what would you say are the biggest challenges that you think women are facing uh, as they try to enter into the policy space? Um, how have you progressed in your career? What challenges have you had to overcome? What do you feel have been your most memorable successes on this journey? And finally, perhaps most importantly, what words of wisdom would you have both to your younger self, but also to other young women who are aspiring to build a career such as yours? You have held the, the South African agriculture docket uh, uh, multiple times. You have served in government. Um, what advice do you have around, around this? Thank you very much, uh, Wanjuru and Meredith uh, as co-chairs. There are very important issues that I would want to pick up, some of which we have just seen on the chat, as well as coming other from other panelists. Maybe just to say, as we continue the conversation, in the chat group, one of the issues that people are concerned about is that the conversation at the moment is more dominant on the production policy. And I would agree that that is important because when we talk about gender responsive policies, it should not only be limited in the production space, but actually must cut across the entirety of the agricultural value chain. So I think it's important that as we engage, we bring that on board because there are various constraints that you will find when you come to tertiary, you know, level of agriculture, particularly on agro processing and the cartels that are there. And I think we need to be able to, to say that upfront, which therefore makes the level of entry difficult. The issues of financing, it's another challenge which cuts across whether you start from the production until the end. If you don't have financing systems that are responsive, particularly to the constraints that those who want to enter the space have, you actually run the risk. If I wanted to use the South African uh, experience, for instance, where post-1994, you found a very dominant, commercialized, and very uh, financial intensive agricultural sector to penetrate and enter and compete effectively. If you don't have enough financial muscle, you are actually not in a good space. So how do we make sure that not only the developmental agencies of state that are responsible for agri-finance or even agro-processing. But we also transform our financial sector generally to make sure that they are responsive to the challenges of those who are new entrants in the sector who would like to participate. The issue raised by Susan, and I'm happy I'll take her, apart, I'm take her on on the issues that she's raised. It's actually quality of information when it comes to women's participation in the sector. 
it's an issue that we are grappling, and I'm sure South Africa is not the only country, but a majority of countries. Even when you come to your statistics um, general, for instance, when they do statistics of countries and they would look at agriculture generally, they don't disaggregate the information in terms of gender, how many women are participating in this sector, in the various subsectors of the economy, what is the market share that they are having on this? It becomes agriculture has performed very well. There are 40,000 commercial farmers, 100,000 small scale farmers, but to disaggregate that, zilch. So these are some of the issues. If we want to really unlock the potential, we need to also have very important data. And I think issue Susan that is raising is very important because if you look at our national systems, even from departmental point of view, that information doesn't come very easily. So women become just people, but in, they are not actually seen in terms of the number and in the value of their contribution. And also looking at the way in which women manage their enterprises. I mean, I've met a number of women farmers, very successful, but what you find, which is always common among women, they don't just deal with the agricultural sector and competition and productivity. They also look at how they are workers, their livelihoods, because they regard those workers as an important resource for their success but also they go beyond the workers to their children. Some of the women have even built, you know, kindergarten facilities on their farms to make sure that the farm workers' children can actually be looked after very well while they participate. Something which is very rare in the way in which men manage their enterprises. So these are some of the issues that we need to look into and disaggregate because the contribution of women into the agricultural sector goes beyond the sector, but also the social impact that those women have in their local communities. So I would agree that it's important to look at what are the tools. And I agree with um, the, my other colleague who also spoke when say looking at the Kenyan situation and you know, the various levels of government, how they themselves can become a constraint in enabling women's participation. Because if you go to a national level, they'll ask you, have you been in the district? Have you been to a province? So these are some of the issues that may not come out very clear in the conversation about, you know, gender responsive policies. So for me, the issue is, Yes, we need to fix policy as much as we can. We need to fix legislation as much as we can, but monitoring and implementation of those is one of the key features that must actually accompany that story if we actually want to see a change in the agricultural sector and that change being beneficial for women. You've raised an issue, Anjiru, about how do we bring in more women into policy making in agriculture. I would say it's at two levels. One level, it's political representation, which is actually not as easy, but it's something that we need to learn from those who have been there before us. The issue of mobilization and ensuring that the women's movement remains active at a country, but also across the borders. I mean, I always say, if you look at the Pan-African Women's Organization of 1962, one of the things that they did, they actually set an agenda for Africa's unity, even though they are never congratulated for that. Men came in 1963. It's the same when you look in South Africa. The first women's charter was in 1954 by the Federation of South African Women. Freedom Charter came in 1955. But in the narrative, you will hear the Freedom Charter. In the narrative in the African continent is the Afri organization of African unity. Power is, is like it never existed, and yet it did. So for me, that solidarity amongst women is important. But also, how do we work with women in across political lines and across religious and class. 
Because if we think we can only emerge because we are either working in our own little corners, I don't think we will be able to achieve. For instance, the Commonwealth uh, Parliamentary Association for so many years have been looking at how we increase women in the legislatures and parliament. There have been studies that have been done by international um, democracy and electoral assistance, international idea about ways in which we can improve, but still we haven't reached that 50% that we would like to see in the legislatures. But for me, it's how do we also empower women legislators so that those of us who may be there, in the way we conduct our oversight, we bring in the women's agenda into those spaces, both in terms of policy and legislation, so that we use our presence to actually change the spaces for the majority of women who may not be there in today's uh, legislatures and parliament and even in the executive. But also how do we support we one another? Because for me, I always say, if you look at how sometimes our learned gentlemen, I know there are some of them here in the platform, sometimes the decisions are made in the golf course than in the boardrooms. By the time they come in the boardrooms, it's affirming a decision that has been canvassed in the 18th hole, you know, as they are moving <laughs> in falls and whatever to reach those decisions. Women, when you come out of your parliamentary responsibility, you must work on the homework of the kids, you must prepare for the men and the supper and whatever. What are the support systems that we put there so that women can be able to engage with the support network to be able to drive the women's agenda. And for me, learning from our forebears, one of the things I learned is the power of the women's movement, because without it, we can never reach where we want to reach. But if we want, as the UN has said in its theme this year, to reach generation equality, we also need to work with men and they understand the importance of having the other half of our society being part and part of building this egalitarian society that we want. So while we may need our spaces and support as women, but we also need to disturb the party and make sure that our gentlemen and our brothers, spouses and all, they appreciate that we're not there to actually try and be like them, but we want to be ourselves and contribute in the rebuilding of a, 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 our society that is equal and that will benefit all of us. I always say, take a woman to the shop. Before she buys her clothes or her bra, whatever you call it, the first thing she will think about, oh, my children's shirt for school. Oh, my husband, you know, thermal vest, it's winter. By the time the sense that remain won't even be equal for her to buy the nice winter dress that she wants. What that says is that women always look beyond themselves and think about the whole of society. And for me, our male counterparts and our partners and brothers shouldn't see that as competition, but is complementarity for building a society. That we can have. Thank you very much, Wanjiri. Um, we've got Winston Makamanyane and uh, Komape, who are from my office, who will continue with the discussion. Thank you. I, was like, I want to applaud and thank you for those stirring remarks. That was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much, Honorable Minister. And uh, I will uh, hand back over to, to, to Meredith to continue. Yeah. Thank you so much. I just wanted to um, ask Susan if she's able to put links to the either the gender assessment she mentioned or the tool into the chat box. That would be wonderful. Um, hearing so much on the need for more monitoring, and evaluation, and data, and but really now when I hear um, a private sector view. So we have with us um, Tiffany Atwell, who is um, the vice president at Corteva Agriscience. 
So, Tiffany. Thank you. Thank you, Meredith. And, and thank you, Honorable Minister, for those in inspiring remarks. Uh, they couldn't be more accurate as to not just what women are facing uh, on the continent in Africa, but really globally. Uh, so Corteva actually is really proud to be able to serve uh, many of the women farmers that we talked about today uh, in many ways. And, and for those of you who don't know Corteva uh, AgriScience, we are a year old and we are born from the Dow DuPont merger, um, which happened in 2017 and spun out into our own uh, pure play ag company. The, the reason I, I mentioned that our, our beginning is because um, as we built this company, uh, first and foremost, uh, it has been part of our values to focus on women and youth. And uh, I know what we're focusing on women today, but I think it, it's just something that I'm very proud of um, that we have looked at uh, the, the focus of women as being critical, uh, not just to our company, but also feeding the world. And so when you think about Corteva and we are in over 140 countries, um, we are looking at trying to provide the best seeds and, of course, uh, crop protection and, and digital solutions for, for many of these women. But, but what really has inspired me um, is the work of the company and the support even from our CEO uh, to ensuring that women globally have the tools that they need to be successful. So, for instance, um, while we were still going through the merger process, we conducted a study in 2018 that really looked at uh, the state of women in agriculture. And, and that's important because a lot of what we've been talking about today is the data that we need to be able to understand what we can do more to include women and to ensure that they're successful uh, in their journey of, of helping to feed the world. And it was, a, it was a study that was conducted that looked at 17 countries, uh, three of, of which are on the continent, of course, Nigeria, South Africa, and Kenya. And in that study, uh, it actually did point to a lot of what we've heard today um, from many of the panelists, and that is, of course, the lack of access to financing, uh, the challenges of being able to own land, and, and also to get adequate training to actually you know, play a role, a leadership role, uh, not just in the policy space, but in the agribusiness space. And so with that data, it has allowed us from a company perspective to be able to look at what part um, of these challenges can we play a role in um, to actually provide some solutions? Because one of the things that I think is important is, of course, we need the government policies in place to support women and to ensure that they have the right to own land and, and actually be able to have financing uh, from, from government institutions, if possible. But the other piece of it is to make any of these programs sustainable, it really has to be connected to the business. And women are very proud. And so they do want to make sure that whatever they're doing, they don't want handouts. What they want is training and equal access to the same types of resources that men have. And this is, of course, not to displace men in any way. Um, when women look at leadership roles, and, and this is what we found in the study, that it really is connected to wanting to uplift their communities and to make sure, as the Honorable Minister was talking about, that they have the ability not just to produce and make money, but also to uplift their communities by building schools, uh, ensuring that their farm workers have access to um, you know, education and, and what they need to be successful. So with that, when you think about that data, what we did with that data is we launched some programs um, and realizing that these are big issues, uh, we knew we couldn't do it alone. And so we have looked at uh, launching programs in partnership <clears throat> with other key um, institutions, in some, some cases governments. Uh, one, one partnership that I'm very proud of is a, a pilot project that we did in Brazil with women um, farmers in Brazil and one of the major uh, ag uh, business schools and Fundação Dom Cabral. And the importance of that in partnership with the Agribusiness Association is we actually provided training to these women farmers um, and it was leadership training. It was also, you know, business acumen, best practices, but also 
policy training, how to be involved in the policy process. And the reason why I mentioned this project in Brazil and the success of it was because now we're able to model these types of projects and we'll be launching a similar project in South Africa uh, in the third quarter of uh, this year where we'll be working with Gibbs um, to provide training for women, uh, black women in South Africa so they can get some of the same tools that we saw as beneficial to what we were able to give to some of the Brazilian farmers. Now we know that this can't be done without partners, um, you know, educational institutional partners but also you know the women who are willing to participate in these types of partnerships and then thinking about once they get this training what what can we do to ensure that they're able to go back and play leadership roles in agribusiness associations and also in policy decisions and making in South Africa so that's something that I'm really excited about that our team in South Africa is working with Gibbs on to see how we can get that launched in the next uh, two months at the latest. One other area that I think is important because we've talked about Kenya and I think it's really something that I'm also very proud of because of the breadth of, of this project. And while we've done women projects in Kenya previously, um, you know, to ensure that women farmers have the educational tools that they need to be more successful, this recent project that we're launching um, today is with Lando Lakes. Uh, the importance of that, uh, this uh, venture is, is because number one, it's, it's going to be 5,000 women farmers in Kenya. Um, and that is going to not just ensure that these women have access to the training and leadership uh, academies, uh, but also to ensure that they know how to get to markets and have a place to sell um, their products when um, they're done, of course, um, with their planning and, and, of course, getting to the next level in ag leadership. So this partnership with Lando Lakes, um, it's Lando Lakes uh, nonprofit venture, 37. Um, we're also working with Bidco, Lando Lakes uh, food and beverage company in Kenya. Forage Genetics International and the International Livestock Research Institute. And as we think about the data that we need, um, that's why working with this diverse group of partners is so important. And this two-year program is really designed uh, not just to ensure that the women are successful financially, but it's also designed to in increase the supply of dairy products and improve the nutrition of local communities. And so if you think about what women um, are, are trying to accomplish when they are in agriculture, it is not just to run a great business, which I think, of course, that's something that they have to focus on uh, first and foremost but they really do want to play a part in feeding the world and, and play a part of feeding their communities. And so this is actually going to be an opportunity to make sure that they have the right education, agronomic training, and so these small harder women farmers can grow and, and have um, really impressive livestock. Um, and then they'll also, because we're partnering with Land Lakes, actually have a direct market to, to sell their end products to. Um, so I think that this is going to be uh, not just an amazing journey for us, but also for Kenya's dairy sector. Um, and we know that it's a critical source um, of nutrition for the local communities. Um, and talking about data um, from what we found annually, the country suffers from nearly 2 billion liter dairy deficit um, uh, already annually. So this is um, something that we think will really also benefit um, the nutritional de deficiencies that, that um, we're seeing right now in, in Kenya. So I'll, I'll pause there just to say, when we think about these types of public-private partnerships, first off, they're not easy, um, but they're absolutely are necessary for us to be successful and, and covering and, and, and making some progress in this space. Um, and when you think about challenges, it is number one, finding the right public-private partnership. Um, and then number two, uh, 
hoping to get support from governments, even if it's just um, moral support and, and saying, hey, you're doing a great job. Um, and, and I'll tell you one thing that does, that does mean a lot because when we've, I've actually talked and uh, spoken to the Brazilian Minister of Agriculture about our project in Brazil, and when other companies, our competitors heard about how encouraged and inspired she was by the work we were doing, they all raised their hand and said, hey, we wanna do projects for women in agriculture as well. And if you can think about it, that's the kind of competition we want. We, we want um, companies in the private sector to raise their hand and say, we need to be committed to these types of projects. First off, it makes business sense, but also I think for all of us who really want to see a world where women are treated equally. It, it also makes uh, sense to try to build a society that we need to see to really be successful for the next generation. Uh, I think one of the other challenges, and, and this is just, um, you think about agriculture, it's been a very tough uh, year for agriculture, not just because of COVID-19, but just because also some, some of the weather distresses we, we face, um, it's money. Um, it's trying to finance uh, these types of projects. And so when I go and other leaders um, go to our business leaders and say, we need money for these types of projects, we really do have to make the business case. Um, societal uh, benefits, I think, are key. Um, but since we're not running this uh, through a philanthropic lens, we really have to make sure that we can make the business case as to why this is going to also benefit us as a company, which is also why the government support can really, really be important here. So I'll, I'll pause there. I think that um, as you do this type of work, you have to remain humble. Um, you have to remain inspired, which is really what I've gotten from all of the panelists that I've already heard from today. Um, because it is a commitment and results don't come overnight. Um, the, the smiles and the thank yous do because women uh, really do appreciate the investment, but it is uh, a long-term commitment for us to really be able to turn the tide and, and build um, an agriculture uh, entrepreneur uh, that is really equal to, to what men have been getting for years and generations. Um, previously. So, so thank you there, Meredith. I'll pause and take any questions later. Thank you so much, Tiffany. Very good remarks from that private sector pr um, perspective and really exciting to hear your announcement about this new program with Lambda Links and Lambda Lakes. And also just hearing what you were talking about, the importance of women in leadership, their roles in the value chain beyond production, and then engaging in policy influence. Um, we're starting to run a little short of time, so we want to move it quickly along to Patricia Vanderbilt with the World Bank. Um, but also noting that I think there's one more Mentimeter question, if um, Wajiro or Doreen could um, put that in the chat box, I think people could be maybe looking at that at the same time. So Patricia, thank you so much for your, your patience, and there you are. Thank you. I'll turn it over to you. Hi, I'm like, hi everyone. Um, thank you for the nice introduction. I'm acutely conscious that there's nine minutes left um, and we've been told you're going to be completely cut off. Um, if so I may, we have been added a couple of extra minutes. So. Okay, great. Because uh. <laughs> um, I was going to say, I'm just going to simplify what I'm going to say and let you finish. Um, but I just want to come a little bit back. I thought it was everything that came up, I really sort of resonated well with me and it's sort of, what is gender responsive policies mean for especially the World Bank group um, and especially the World Bank group agriculture sector we do projects so I think the way I think about it is um, it's not just the outcome of gender inclusive uh, agriculture and food system which is uh, benefits women but the process of achieving it and one of the things that we're really looking into recently in recent work uh, that has highlighted this is that inclusive food systems need to have women um, at both the figurative and the literal table. Um, they, they need to participate and they need to be part of the process of designing um, inclusive and profitable uh, food systems. And so they need to be part of the question, how can women better their own lives through the participation in the food system? And as we build back better, especially post COVID, and we talked about some of the policies that need to be uh, better and not gender neutral, the design itself needs to include their participation and voice to be sustainable, effective, and amplified. And one of the things the World Bank is doing, we have a gender strategy and it rests on four pillars, improving human endowments, 
removing constraints for more and better jobs, removing barriers to women's ownership and control over assets, and enhancing women's voice and agency and engaging men and boys. So this is four huge pillars um, that enhance a little bit our work that is a baseline of mainstreaming. So in the food and agriculture practice, we are going beyond women farmers as the beneficiary. This is still really, really important work. And we need to make sure that everything we do and everything we work in partnership with client countries, that they're accessing inputs, accessing credit and services and information and markets and they're profitable farmers. But we also need to go beyond that. And what we're doing, via the gender strategy is looking at gender gaps and looking where men and women don't have the same access, aren't facing the same constraints, are endowed differently and unequally. And so projects with the strategy act beyond the project to close gender gaps uh, and we track that and, and revise that. So while we're still working on very important work in the agriculture sector, such as making sure that everything that is provided by a project in inputs, advisory services, research and development, access to market, but we don't just do assets. We also do jobs and voice and agency and endowments as these are part of our four pillars. And these is where we want to really close gender gaps. And we need to do redressing and jobs means including women also in the jobs that are created to help the agriculture system. It also means voices having maybe quotas of representation in boards and committees that decide on communal infrastructure and access to markets. And this needs to go all the way to the top. Women need to be, have jobs in the sector and need to participate in the decisions that the sector makes. Um, but this is really hard because it's changing a system and we know this and there's, you know, there's well-documented issues with bias. And I think this was superbly mentioned earlier on that you can have it all written down, but the actual reality of the land and the way the, some customs work, they just don't match with what's written down. And so you have to start small and really, I think one of the big important things is that we start with in every World Bank project, we need to start with the analysis and that is sort of remove, there's no such thing as gender blind. We need to put the gender goggles on and look at where there's different acts, where there's different constraints, where the access is different and address those really root systems, root problems that hamper women's participation. So one of the examples um, to uh, women's participation in agricultural policy making, one of the things that hinders them is, of course, and I mentioned is childcare. Um, it's, there's other issues such as mobility, uh, education, uh, bias, GBV are all deep factors that affect women's participation. But sometimes we say we've put everything in place, but why aren't the women able to access something? And it turns out it's this root cause that it doesn't mesh with their household uh, duties or their care burden. So in one project, um, we sort of practiced what we preached and all of the staff who worked for this project that was launched in Mongolia, um, there are quotas for women workers in our own project, but also the office has a child, mini child care facility to facilitate basically the reaching of these quotas. So it's sort of really getting to the bottom of why women are participating. And that's just one example and there's loads of them, um, which could be, is it in a convenient location to get the information, uh, the advisory services? Is there a safety issue in terms of why women don't access it? Is it at the wrong time? Um, so looking at these, I think, is really part of the way we, we, am, we sort of focus on how to get women, <laughs> get women in. But also to get women in and to convince everyone else to get women in, we need to have the right evidence. And that's where the data is really important. We need to get women counted in the agriculture sector. So there's a couple of initiatives involved. I saw some of them in the chat. Um, the CG is of course involved. We have the 50 by 2030 initiative, which has a huge gender component being developed by IFPRI, where we need to account for their work, but account for also how they interact differently in agriculture and food systems and have that evidence to be able to write, but also implement and discuss uh, policy better. So we need to have it and present it and the World Bank really, um, of course, this is our bread and butter, is data <laughs> and evidence. We also have the World Bank Women, Business and the Law, which looks at any kind of institutional regulatory underlying constraints that there are to women's full participation, either it's political or in the uh, private sector. So, so this, is a, this is a tricky thing and I think I'm just gonna go straight to the last set of questions. Um, which was how do you how do you get this work going? And you just 
I think it's gender needs to be also removed from a niche space. Good gender focused policies that include women are better for entire economies. They're better for countries and we need the evidence. We need the arguments. We need, we need the, the examples, which is what we're doing. Um, and everyone is doing such a great job at this. And this is what the process is on route. It's, it's happening. So, but it needs to be removed from outside to just, this is just better for everyone. But one big part of it, and I think the bottom line is we can't create it without women's voices and women's participation. And we need to question all male systems and consistently ask for women to qualify. But one of the things is also look at what are the underlying constraints. And so that's um, kind of where I'm finishing is sort of, yes, big picture, but also let's also keep the goggles on to see why, why women can't participate sometimes without a little bit of extra help. So thank you very much for having me. Thank you so much, Patricia and all the panelists. I'm gonna turn the moderation now over to Wanjiru. I think she put up that other Mentimeter question. I don't know if someone can share um, that screen. We can see what the answers have been. And then Wanjiru, I'll let you um, move ahead with how you wish with the time we have left in the session. Yeah, thank you so much, Meredith. And thank you so much to each of the panelists. I know we are running uh, low on time, but and thanks to um, the HURF secretary for giving us a couple of more minutes to continue. Um, as you can see, we have our survey going on. Go to www.menti.com and use the code 5716715 and you will find yourself on our survey. And here we really want to talk about and hear from you on what you think are the biggest obstacles to improving the numbers and experiences of women leading agricultural uh, policy on the continent. As we are doing that, um, there have been a set of questions and conversations that have been happening on the chat. I just want to, and Meredith, with your permission, I'm also going to wrap this up with the final comments from our presenters. If we could hear from each of the panelists, starting with um, Honorable Lina Kilimo, um, what, which of the questions that have been posted on the chat uh, do you want to engage with? Or do you, would you be so kind as to share your own personal experience in um, rising to, the, to where you are um, really sitting at the table in government setting um, policy and what advice you may have for, for others who are coming up in the sector and use those as your closing remarks, please. If I could give each one of you three minutes. Honorable Kilimo, would you mind going first? Yes, uh, thank you very much. The biggest obstacles is working uh, so hard to prove that you can do it. I think the biggest obstacle is trying to assert, assert yourself that you can do it because all around you have that notion that women are weakling or it cannot be done by women. And I would say what encourages me is um, a song that I sing with the girls that used to say, a girl child can do what a boy child can do if only given the chance. So all the time you want to say, I can do what a boy child can do, just give me the chance, pushing for that chance. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. If we could go on to, I believe, uh, uh, Miss Atwa. Sure. Uh, I, I oh, we'll go ahead. You want to Susan first? Okay. That's fine. I'm sorry. No, no, no. Miss Sat Miss Satwell, and then we'll come back to Dr. Karia. Okay. Okay. I I would just say, um, similar to the last um, comments that we've been making, it, it really is for women to believe that they can do it. Um, most of them are really already prepared, um, but what they lack is the, the opportunity and and oftentimes the confidence because they haven't viewed themselves as leaders and women. Um, we actually don't need the title to do the hard work. Um, so I, I think that we have to get them to understand we need them to lead we need them to have a seat at the table um, and also to get out of their own way because I, I am a firm believer that no one really can stop you but yourself and as an African American woman um, that has been doing people that have 
out at me. And it was my belief in myself that helped me overcome that. And so I, I think that that's something, whether you or not, it's, it's something that we all face as, as women leaders. Thank you so much, Ms. Atwell. Dr. Carrier? Uh, thank you very much. Um, several, I, I'll, I'll be very brief. I think the, the most, one of the most important things has been said time and time again, and I just want to repeat it, that we must have women at those tables. We must make sure that women farmers have a voice. But for them to do that, we must strengthen their capacity so that they understand the issues, they know how to raise the issues when they're in those debates. And that doesn't happen automatically. Just because we put them there, it's not enough. We must continue to work with them, to train them, to give them the skills and expertise in leadership and to understand the issues. Uh, that's hugely important. But the second thing is that we also must train a young generation of women leaders to come to take up this space. Uh, we, we need young women who understand the field, who are researchers in the field, um, and we need to support them. We need to train them in masters, in PhDs, in this. I, and I think I'm just making a pitch for, for your program, uh, Wanjiro, but I think it's hugely important. It's not enough that the, the women have PhDs and masters, they also need that other training, the training that makes them aware. What does it mean to be a leader, an African woman? And how do you challenge the traditional norms of leadership that we've been raised with? Um, how do you speak up when you need to? This requires training. And just having the PhD is not enough. With people actually need to be trained. How do you publish your work? How do you present your work in international fora? These are really, really important aspects in terms of making sure we have the numbers, but also they are able to represent themselves, their ideas, and to represent rural women. Thank you very much. Over to you. Thank you so much. And uh, Patricia, Ms. Vandervel. Um, hi. Um, so uh, <laughs> just a little closing remark, I just, Kind of, I kind of went to them immediately in my earlier point, um, but one was definitely enabling participation. And I think sort of reiterating um, what Susan just said, exactly, yes, one is getting the, um, the table, but also providing all the right tools. And this is really, really structural um, and will require thinking, uh, thinking backwards a lot as well, because we can't just dish out capacity building uh, without, you know, identifying and stuff. So, um, and also it's a bit like empowerment. Empower you can't give empowerment. Um, uh, women's empowerment is, is taken from women uh, themselves. So, but we have to be able to understand that systems are rigged <laughs> um, uh, in a way they're already set up in ways that are, um, that have different sort of obstacles for women especially. So. Um, leveling the playing field, um, which is actually one of the big World Bank reports, um, is something that I think is everyone's job to do. Um, men, women, um, multilateral, private sector, we all have a job in making sure that uh, everyone can be at this table and women need a little bit more help sometimes to get to this table, but so do others and it will just make a better table. <laughs> um, so there's two levels to this and I think that the first step is of course acknowledging it and I think acknowledging the flaws but also what doesn't work um, that it's it's not just as easy to have programs and projects um, and that so many sectors are at play you could have a great um, agriculture project and program that involves um, mostly involves a woman reading and then if you haven't had that bit block in place then you're kind of just throwing it into place so I think all these platforms working together, using the gender lens, but everyone needs to use it. And redressing um, inequalities is sort of the, the really the way forward. And I'm, I, I'm seeing it. I'm very excited to, for this future. Thanks very much. Um, 
recognizing that we are now playing on a borrowed time and we've got roughly three minutes to go meredith uh, my co-moderator do you have any thoughts do you want to share maybe some of what you've been doing at usaid or maybe a question as you've been looking at the chat conversation a question that has come out uh, yeah. for you specifically? any yeah. reflection to share yeah. thank you Andrew. <clears throat> and again thank you all the panelists I've been so inspired and also the participants and I just want to say that we're going to be taking all of this back because we've learned so much from you today both from the panel and the participants and using this and thinking about the, the issues you have raised what are the themes coming out and how can we use this in our programming what are the you know clearly we need to take a deeper look at what are we doing with monitoring and evaluation and data and following up on the policies and are we doing enough on training um, women for these leadership roles that they need to be taking on um, so these are the kind of things that we're going to be using with this information so we thank you so much for being part of this kind of crowdsourcing with us um, so it's been really great thank you to everyone um, I, in closing, will also thank everyone and especially to those of our panelists who are um, doing this from the US. We know it is early morning for you. We really appreciate that you were up at the crack of dawn to be part of this session with us. We do not take that for granted. I think there's been so many learnings that are just going to be absolutely valuable for us also as a ward as we continue to strengthen and think through how we, we, we strengthen and improve improve our own work around capacity building as we explore whether the policy space is a space where that um, we also need to be focusing on on building the capacities of women in agricultural policy we are in a moment of exploration around that and so this conversation is very much um, informing what what we want to do i want to take each a, a moment to thank each one of the participants for your time for your attention and for the generosity of, that is of thought that is in the comment section the questions there's so many links and resources that have been shared we this meeting has been recorded and so we shall endeavor to try and share with you a recording of it and certainly working through the learnings to try and distill uh, distill those and so without wanting to risk being cut off halfway or mid-sentence i want to thank you for allowing us an extra 10 minutes again to each of our panelists uh, thank you so much i wish you all an absolutely wonderful rest of your day and evening Oh, and thank you to the American folks in the US. We know it's a public holiday for you. It's Memorial Day, and you are up at the crack of dawn on a public holiday <laughs> to be in this important conversation. We do not take it for granted. Thank you. We're so glad to be here, and it's actually Labor Day. So we are Labor, oh, yes. Labor Day. <laughs> yes, Labor Day. So, thank you, everyone. Have yourself for a wonderful good cause. Day. Thank you, Andrew. Yeah. Bye. Bye, and Bye. thank you. Thank you.